In the previous episode, we saw how both Young and Fresnel had put forward the view that the vibrations of light are performed at right angles to its direction of propagation. Fresnel also pointed out that this might be explained by assuming that the ether possesses the power of resisting attempts to distort its shape, and could be likened to an elastic solid. After Fresnel's death, this concept was developed further, and this is what we will examine in this episode. The idea that the ether is composed of an elastic solid has one rather glaring problem. How is it possible that the planets, in their orbital motions, are able to journey through it at immense speeds without encountering any predictable resistance? The first person to address this was Sir George Gabriel Stokes. He had suggested that the ether may behave both as a solid and a liquid. For objects with very rapid vibrations, like light, it would behave like an elastic solid, but for those moving with comparatively slower speeds, it would act like a liquid. In 1828, Poisson succeeded in solving the differential equations to determine the wave motions possible in an elastic solid. This revealed that there are two types of waves created in elastic solids, transverse and longitudinal. The longitudinal waves cause dilation and condensations or compressions and rarefactions, just like sound waves. Whereas the transverse waves do not cause these, just a distortion of the shape while maintaining a constant density. Up until this point, the investigations had only considered isotropic bodies. In 1828, Augustin Louis Cauchy would extend this to examine light in a crystalline substance. The general equation he obtained were extensive, containing 21 constants. From this he came up with two theories. In the first, the assumption is that the vibrations which constitute light were executed parallel to the plane of polarization, and the second where they would be executed at right angles to the plane of polarization. Both equations would give a reasonable overall equivalence for light in a crystal, but they would also show that a third type of longitudinal wave would also be created. This presented a rather large problem with this concept. Cauchy felt that the existence of these vibrations would ultimately be demonstrated experimentally. A further objection to this theory is that the relations between the constants do not appear to admit any simple physical interpretation, being evidently assumed for the sole purpose of forcing the formulae into some degree of conformity with the results of experiment. His work at this point did also not account for reflection or refraction. In order to explain refraction, it is necessary to assign a cause for the existence of refractive indices. In other words, an explanation for the variations in the velocity of light from one body to another. Previously, we have discussed that Huygens had suggested that transparent bodies consist of hard particles which interact with ethereal matter, modifying its elasticity. Cauchy, in his initial papers, followed this lead and assumed the density of the ether is the same in all media, but that its rigidity varies from one medium to another. Cauchy would go on to force a theory for the reflection, and in so doing would have to compromise his earlier theories. In order to make his equations fit Fresnel's ratio of the intensity of the reflected ray, he had to adopt his second theory that the vibrations were executed at right angles to the plane of polarization of the light. The theory he advanced was therefore encumbered with many difficulties. His decision to select certain conditions was evidently to secure the fulfillment of Fresnel's sign law and tangent law, but the results are inconsistent with the true boundary conditions which were given later by Green. Later, he would even abandon his earlier assumption that the density of the ether is the same in all material bodies. These features bring out the weakness of Cauchy's method of attacking the problem. His object was to derive the properties of light from a theory of the vibrations of elastic solids. At the outset, he already had in his possession the differential equations of motions of the solid, which were to be his starting point, and the equations of Fresnel his goal. It only remained to supply the boundary conditions at the interface, which are required in the discussion of reflection, and the relations between the elastic constant of the solid, which are required in the optics of crystals. The problem with this approach is that it will allow for multiple solutions, 
Within the space of 10 years, the great French mathematician produced two distinct theories of crystal optics and three theories of reflections, almost all yielding correct or nearly correct final formulae, and yet most irreconcilable with each other, and involving incorrect boundary conditions and improbable relations between the elastic constants. At around the same time, James McCullough and Franz Neumann were also attempting to tackle the same problem in an almost identical approach. They felt that the great objection to Fresnel's theory of reflection was its failure to provide for the continuity of the normal component of displacement at the interface between the two media. If the ether were an elastic solid, then there could be no discontinuity. The only way they could achieve this was by assuming the vibrations of the ether were parallel to the plane of polarization. In order to obtain the sine and tangent law, they had to assume that the inertia of the medium is the same everywhere. The differences in the behavior of different substances will be due to the differences in its elasticity. Sadly, these theories did not advance much on the quasi-mechanical theories of their predecessors. This much-needed reformation would eventually come from Green in 1837. Instead of designing boundary conditions for the express purpose of yielding Fresnel's sine and tangent law, he set to work to determine the conditions which are actually satisfied at the interfaces of real elastic solids. What he was able to determine was that the boundary conditions that must be satisfied at the interface between two elastic media in contact meant that the three components of displacement and stress across the interface are equal in two media. It was now straightforward to obtain the boundary conditions for reflection and refraction. He found that the vibrations of the ethereal particles is executed at right angles to the plane of incidence. The intensity of the reflected rays obey Fresnel's law provided the rigidity is assumed to be the same for all media, but the inertia to vary from one medium to another. Green's conclusion confirmed the hypotheses of Fresnel that the vibrations were executed at right angles to the plane of polarization, and that the optical differences between media are due to the different densities of the ether within them. The only thing left for Green to explain was the cause where the incident light is polarized at right angles to the plane of incident, so that the motion of the ethereal particles is parallel to the intersection of the plane of incident with the front of the wave. In this case, it is impossible to satisfy the boundary conditions without assuming that the longitudinal vibrations are generated by the act of reflection. Green avoided this difficulty by adopting Fresnel's suggestion that the resistance of the ether to compression may be very large in comparison with the resistance to distortion, as is the case when we examine real examples of elastic solids like jelly. The problem now was that the ratio of the intensities of the transverse wave does not agree with Fresnel's tangent formula, and his theory of reflection does not harmonize well with the elastic solid theory of crystal optics. And this means that the vibrations of the Greenian solid do not create an exact parallel to the vibrations which constitute light. McCullen was keen to seek a solution to these problems, and presented his own theory to the Royal Irish Academy in 1839. From Green's investigations, he concluded that it was not possible to explain optical phenomena satisfactorily by comparing the ether to an elastic solid of the ordinary type, which resists compression and distortion. He saw that the only hope was to devise a medium which should be as strictly conformable to the dynamic laws as Green's elastic solid, and yet should have its properties specially designed to fulfil the requirements of the theory of light. In a normal elastic solid, the potential energy of the strain depends only on the change of size and shape of the volume elements, their compression and distortion. For McCullen's new medium, on the other hand, the potential energy would depend only on the rotation of the volume elements, and this immediately meant that no longitudinal waves would be created. McCullough's work was regarded with doubt by his own peers and the succeeding generation of mathematical physicists, and can scarcely be said to have been properly appreciated until Fitzgerald drew attention to it 40 years later. There can be no doubt that McCullough really solved the problem of devising a medium whose vibrations, calculated in accordance with the correct laws of dynamics, should have the same properties as the vibrations of light.
The hesitation which was felt in accepting the rotational elastic ether arose mainly from the lack of any example of a body which had such properties. This would be removed by Lord Kelvin in 1889, who designed mechanical models possessing rotational elasticity. If we imagine a structure formed of spheres arranged so that it is at the centre of a tetrahedron formed by its four closest neighbours, each sphere is connected to these four by rigid bars which have spherical caps at the ends so as to slide freely on the spheres. Such a structure would, for small deformations, behave like an incompressible perfect fluid. Now attached to each bar a pair of gyroscopically mounted flywheels, rotating with equal and opposite angular velocities, with their axes in line of the bar, and this would give the whole structure a quasi-elasticity exactly as McCullough had envisioned. Based on the idea of both Green and McCullough, Cauchy published a third theory in 1839. In this theory he took up the remark by Green that the longitudinal wave might be avoided in either of these two ways. Firstly, supposing its velocity to be extremely fast compared to light, or extremely slow. Cauchy chose the latter for his theory, and this would require him to have an elastic medium of negative compressibility. This implied that no work is required to be done in order to give the medium any small irrotational disturbance. An example of such a medium is given by a homogeneous foam free from air and held from collapse by adhesion to a containing vessel. This type of ether was called a contractile ether. The great advantage of this type of ether is that it overcomes the difficulty of securing continuity of the normal components of displacement at an interface between two media. Lord Kelvin would later on devote much of his attention to this type of ether. He assumed that in space, devoid of normal matter, the ether is practically incompressible, but in the space occupied by solids and liquids, it has a negative compressibility. This assumption is based on the idea that material atoms move through space without displacing the ether. A concept that Lord Kelvin had remarked contradicts the old scholastic axiom that two different portions of matter cannot simultaneously occupy the same space. He thought the ether to be attracted and repelled by atoms, and thereby to be condensed and rarefied. It is impossible to avoid noticing throughout Kelvin's work evidence of the deep impression which was made upon him by the writings of Green. And indeed it is no exaggeration to describe Green as the real founder of the Cambridge School of Natural Philosophers, of which Kelvin, Stokes, Riley, Maxwell, Lamb, J. J. Thompson were the most illustrious members in the latter half of the 19th century. The attempt to represent the properties of the ether by those of an elastic solid lost some of its interest after the rise of the electromagnetic theory of light. In 1867, before the electromagnetic hypothesis had attracted much attention, an elastic solid theory which was in many aspects preferable to its predecessors was presented to the French Academy by Joseph Boussinesque. Up until this time, there had been two different views of how the light was propagated in the ether, one who viewed it as being caused by the variations in the inertia of the medium, and the other that it was due to the variations in the elastic properties. Boussinesque took the view that the ether is exactly the same in all material bodies as in interplanetary space, the same everywhere both in inertia and elasticity. The optical properties of matter are due to the interactions between the ether and the material particles. These material particles were disseminated in the ether much like dust particles floating in the air. He viewed that all ethereal processes are to be represented by two kinds of equations, of which one kind expresses the invariable equations of motion of the ether, while the other kind expresses the interactions between the ether and matter. Many years afterwards these ideas were revived in connection with the electromagnetic theory, and in these forms they were indeed of fundamental importance. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.